So how many of you have a band around your um, arm to measure your steps? Anybody having it here? Not even one? <laughs> okay. But you, some of you will have that in the future, definitely, because that, that's something more and more people are using to keep in exercise. I'm also using it because it's brilliant, you know, every afternoon I'll go for an extra walk with the dog, so I walk my 10,000 steps every day, and I'll compete, compete with my friends on this, and it really works very well for me. But, how come that I don't use my real name on this one, Fitbit.com? Because I actually started reading the terms of conditions. Fitbit.com, who owns this, is an American company. And if you read terms of conditions there, you find out that they actually sell your data. And some of their customers are insurance companies. So, of course, I had to invent another name and uh, protect myself. I don't want to give them my true data because I don't trust them. I don't think they are data ethical. And that's the same with Facebook. When I went on Facebook eight years ago, uh, a friend of mine, a lawyer, she read the terms of conditions. How many of you read the terms of conditions on Facebook? Hands up. I can see one hand, two hands, three hands. And you're working with children? Well, if you read the terms of conditions of Facebook, you would run away screaming, I, I'm just saying. So I also invented a new identity for Facebook because I don't trust Facebook. I'm sorry, I know it's a sponsor of this conference, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll explain you why. But this is my true name, and I'm here as a real identity <laughs> to, to today, and I'm also using my real identity online most of the time when I'm a professional, when I'm here as a journalist or a, sp a speaker or an author, and when I'm discussing things online, I'm very, very active. I have a big profile on Twitter in my own name, so I separate my identities between anything which is a little private and then professionally. Professionally, I'm of course always honest and use my own name, but I'm not giving my true data to companies I don't trust to companies who thrive on my data without telling exactly what they're doing with my data. And I'll tell you a little more about that. Um, tomorrow, I'm in a workshop about digital self-defense, wh what kind of tools you can use to protect yourself against uh, all this tracking of you and how you can be there, be out there, and not be tracked from Facebook and Google and all these other uh, companies. But am I then a paranoid uh, person or am I a, a, f a consumer of the future? I believe I am probably both. <laughs> I think we need to be paranoid out there. Uh, but if we look at consumer surveys, global consumer surveys, we actually see a trend now that consumers, they won't take this anymore. I mean, they're, going, they're changing now. We see, for example, that one out of three Europeans they are faking or they are using different information. They don't give away their true information in order to obtain stuff because they want to protect themselves. And the younger people are, the more they use uh, fake information. We could also call it pseudonyms. You know, before Facebook, young people or children, they would use a pseudonym on a game to protect themselves. Today, more and more people are using their real identities because that's what Facebook and others are telling you because they can make more money on real identities. So, a pseudonym is not something illegal. I know a lot of criminal people are using it, but if you want privacy, you can also use it without being a criminal. Um, we are also seeing among the young people, very young people, that they are not willing anymore to give away their data to obtain a service. And that's a problem of today that we get a lot of free stuff out there, right? Facebook, Google and all these, they're free or very cheap. And then we pay with our data. But we are starting to realize that we are paying blindfolded. We don't know how much we're paying. How much is your birthday worth? Or all your friends on Facebook, you know, for example, all your friends on Facebook can help you or stop you from getting a loan today. So we are getting aware that our data is actually worth a lot for, and it's, it can destroy our career possibilities, especially for very young people. 
I don't know if you heard about uh, Spot Spotify who changed their privacy policy um, maybe a month ago. Spotify, which is a Swedish company, uh, a lot of people use Spotify. How many of you in here use Spotify? Yeah, that's more than having read the terms of conditions. But Spotify changed the privacy policy two week, a couple of weeks ago, and they decided that even though you're paying for Spotify, to, to continue being a consumer, you need to give Spotify all your pictures in your smartphone, all your contacts, all your friends, all your phone numbers of your friends, and you need to give your location, your constant location, where you are constantly. Location is just as good as your fingerprint. But there was an uproar. A lot of people got really annoyed on Twitter. And they, the, the CEO of Spotify had to go out and say, oh, sorry, we, we, we will make this voluntary. So we are seeing uh, uh, signs of the movement now of people saying, this is too much. I want to control my own identity. I'm going to show you a little movie uh, when we stop for the break if you want to. Uh, because we don't have that much time. It's important to say that there are lots of good data. I think we have a big, big, we have big opportunities with data in, in Europe. We can really make a lot of money on data. And just two examples, three examples of uh, good big data, what I call good big data. For example, Vestas, who are making wind turbines, they have built up a computer with so much knowledge about wind that they can decide where to put this wind turbine within one click before it would take them one and a half years to make that decision. So they make a lot of money on knowing where to put the wind turbines. And that's big data. Another example is this American company who has um, taken 80,000 menu cards from restaurants and they have scraped all the data and they are making analysis on what kind of food do we eat? Do we want organic? What kind of raw materials? What, what are the trends within f eating? And they're selling that, and they're making a lot of money on that. And it's completely harmless. It doesn't hurt any of us. It's not personal data. And the last example is this Finnish company who put small chips in the garbage bins around uh, outside houses. So the cars, the trucks, will only go and empty them when they're full. Today, a lot of trucks go and empty them when they're half full. So they can make, save a lot of money and be good to the environment. That's another good example of big data. But there are lots of bad big data, of course, as well. Um, I wouldn't say that Amazon and Netflix is 100% bad big data. Of course it's not. And it's pretty nice to have personalized offers. But you know what they are doing also. Uh, one thing is to give you an offer. Well, this book is really good or this film is really good. But the next thing what they're doing now as well is that they're giving you a different price depending on how much they know about you. Do they, um, are you a person who really, really wants this book? You get a higher price. So, so that's where it's coming, it's, it's becoming really unethical, I think. Uh, we're not getting the same prices. If you're rich, you, get, you might get a higher price or if you're really smart, you might get a lower price. You know, if I'm sitting in Denmark and I want to rent a car, uh, in uh, Spain, I will always change my IP address to be a German because then I get 20% lower prices because Germans get cheaper prices than Danes. So that's pretty nice to know. Did you hear about this? You all heard about this example of this American supermarket who found out by data who will become pregnant within the next, uh, uh, within the next six months. They could use big data and find out who will get pregnant. And they could market their uh, products towards these women. D did you hear about that? It, anybody didn't hear about that? Because it's three years old, you, you, you heard about it. Wow. Yeah, well, maybe. Well, it's, it's really interesting because if you study people, for example, who are pregnant, and you know that in the fourth month they discuss this and this, in the seventh month they buy this and this, and then if you s compare uh, other people's behavior to people who have been pregnant with lots and lots of, lots of data, you can predict who will become pregnant with maybe 80% probability. And then you can market towards these people. And that's what they did, and they made a lot of money on that.
But one day, a father came down to the supermarket really, really annoyed because his 16-year-old daughter kept getting advertising as if she was pregnant. And he didn't know she was pregnant. But the supermarket knew she was pregnant. And also predictive policing, do you know about that? In, in the States, for example, in 30 states out of 50 states, they use big data to find out whether they should release a prisoner or not. How is he behaving? What is his social data? What is his history compared to all the others who have been released before? How big a risk is there that he will commit another murder when he's out on probation? And of course, data can be really good if it's in the right hands. So what are the right hands to judge whether this data is good enough or not? The Chicago police, you know, an insurance company can say, well, you need a higher premium than you because you live in an area which is not, there are not that many robberies in that area. But today you can go down to the individual and say, well, you have a higher risk than you have to develop a criminal record. So the police in Chicago will go out to those people who have a higher risk to develop a criminal record to try and stop them from developing it. So you really have to be ethical understanding to use those data, I think. The final example of bad big data is uh, Facebook as well. I'm sorry. Um, very, you, you, you need very, very few likes to find out if you are a homosexual, what kind of political beliefs you have, if you're smoking cigarettes or pot. It's really easy to find out, even though you don't click on anything in that area. It's only on your behavior, your normal behavior. And that's why I really believe that all children should have another name on Facebook until they understand what it means to be a public person, uh, to protect them and give them a chance. Um, there are so many consequences already out there, and I only have those 25 minutes probably cut down to 15 minutes, but just one example of my nephew. He went to the US last year as an exchange student, and kids, of course, they want that, but the Americans, they want really good, ki good kids to come there. They do it for free, so they investigate those children very carefully. They will do a social profile on them, and they found out that Robert, my nephew, on Twitter somewhere, he had written that he was an atheist. atheist. That's okay in Denmark, not to have any religion. And we would never, ever lift an eyebrow on that. But in the U.S., if you're staying with a family in Alabama who goes to church every Sunday, you do, you're not an atheist. So he had to go and change his digital reputation to get that family. So even if you are a young child and you want to work in an American company or you want to go to an uh, American university, you really need to have clean digital footprints. And, and a lot of young people know how to do this today, I, fortunately. But a lot of people don't either know it, right? You probably heard about this American woman. She was traveling from New York to South Africa. And just before she left on the plane, she was tweeting, I'm going to Africa. Hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding, I'm white. It's a funny remark. She is not a racist, but it sounds racist, right? And we are all humans. We do stupid things every day. She's she, she went on the plane, and she was offline for 11 hours. And when she landed in South Africa, a guy came out to the airport to take a picture of that white bitch, racist bitch, just landed in South Africa. And today, she can't get a job or a boyfriend. Because if you Google her, she's a white bitch. And, and her life has been destroyed by that stupid treat, which a lot of us are doing, because we are, we are humans. Um, also, we have to remember, what is a data, data ethical company? Uh, I usually recommend to look at European tools because we have a much harsher law on privacy. For example, when Facebook is talk, or Snapchat, is, or even Google sometimes, when they talk of privacy, they talk of social privacy. That means you can protect yourself against you and you and you, but you can't protect yourself against Facebook and all Facebook's paying partners. And that's what we need to understand. It's not true privacy. We need to understand that it, if you are on uh, social media, it's a public platform. 
And that's the, um, the business model invented by the Americans. I think uh, Americans are, have done so many wonderful things and m lots of wonderful tools and I love it and I use it. But there is a problem here. And fortunately we are seeing now, especially in Europe but also in the US, a trend that we are trying to reverse this business model. It can't be true that everything we buy is tracking by default. It's surveillance by default. We need to have privacy by default. And if you want to be tracked, then you can opt in for that. So we are seeing now a trend, very little trend, but it's coming and I'm sure it will be um, supported by the new European data protection laws. Um, even Apple, uh, I don't know if you can trust Apple, but I'll always trust Apple more than I'll trust, for example, Facebook, because Apple makes it mo its money from selling gadgets. It is also collecting data, but we haven't yet seen them make money on data in the same way as, for example, Google and Facebook. But he is really, really out there saying we want to protect your privacy. So we're seeing that coming from the States as well. I would, however, always trust European companies. And for example, many years ago, Deutsche Telekom made this email made in Germany. And lots, lots of Germans went for that email because it's really true private. And we're seeing lots of email services coming out of Switzerland and Germany and Norway and Finland, which you can really trust. Also, this little kit memo, it's a Finnish, Finnish uh, com competitor in some ways to Facebook, because I don't know how many of you put your children on Facebook. I would never do that. A lot of Danish people are doing that. A lot of people on Facebook are uh, showing off their kits. But this is an alternative where you can put pictures of your kids and share with few of your friends and uh, it's your data. You're not giving away the pictures or your data to Facebook. You own your own data here. Lego in Denmark is also a very good example of a data ethical company. They asked Facebook, if we use a Facebook logon, you know a lot of sites use Facebook as a login. If you Lego would ask Facebook, if we use Facebook as a login for all our children, what kind of data are you taking from us? And Facebook didn't answer. So Lego decided not to use Facebook as a logon, and they have their own logon. So they have 50 million children as users, and they also recommend all the children there to use a pseudonym to even add an extra layer of protection on top of that. And I think that's a data ethical company, and that's where we should focus our um, attention in the future, who are protecting us in a true way and who are not. How many of you use Google when you search? <laughs> How many of you? Come on. Everybody's using Google, right? That's what we are all doing in Europe. We are supporting a big data machine every day with money. And today, actually, honestly, we do have alternatives. So if all of you just could use 10, 20, or 30% of your searches on one of these search engines instead, we are going to change the world a little bit together. Um, instead of having the EU to fight Google in a, an antitrust case, right? We should change our behavior and look for alternatives. Look for data ethical companies. The final thing I'll say is that we are seeing a trend coming out of Europe as well uh, of trying to make a new infrastructure to build new services where we are protected by default. So we can go online without having constantly to be aware of who are stealing or taking or using our data. But that will take a long time before that. And that's why we really need also as consumers and children and parents and teachers to take this in our own hands and do what I call digital self-defense. If you want to learn to teach your children or teens, this is mainly for teenagers, this is a little free booklet I can mail to you. It's about how to protect your private identity and how to optimize your professional identity. When you're a teenager, you start building a professional identity. You need to be out there. You need to be found on Google. 
you need to try and control all the positive stuff about you because that's your CV today. So we, I made this little book ab about it and it's translated into English, not Polish, I'm sorry. But uh, if you email me, I'll send it to you uh, if you want to have some more tools or you can get it tomorrow at the workshop. Thank you.